So perhaps it will be a good idea to go back and fill in the background and talk about what GM is and how it emerged and why. Sure. So why, after thousands of years of agriculture and a huge range of the things we have to eat now, do we still need new plant varieties? Well, I think you need to go back to the beginning and ask why, ask what happened in agriculture. Because in the beginning, presumably, <coughs> um, people were hunter-gatherers and then somebody got the bright idea that you don't need to go and gather, you can actually plant the stuff near to home and so on. So no doubt they planted different varieties of the plants they found around. And then no doubt, I mean nobody actually knows this for sure, but no doubt in the course of time they realised that they were getting new ones. And what they were seeing was in fact related plants were crossing. And so at some time people must have realised that you can deliberately cross plants in order to get new forms coming out. And then they could begin to improve on what they had, because well, the original plants were really not very good as food sources, and so you need to improve the yield, that's an obvious thing. One of the, one of the clear things you need to do with cereals is to stop the seed pod shattering too early, so that the seeds, you don't want the seeds scattered on the ground, you want them left on the plant until you're ready to, to take them off. And all of those sorts of things, <coughs> many wild plants are poisonous and people had to learn how to breed the poison out of them, or reduce the poison. Some of them still are, actually, and people have, therefore, to use appropriate techniques to deal with it. All those sorts of things, as well as tastes, um, dealing with climate differences, wanting to grow a plant in an area where it's not native, you need to modify it, and so on. So over the course of thousands of years, people have done a lot of that. And we still do it because new diseases arise, and farmers have to be, therefore, able to cope with that. We are having climatic conditions. We do want to spread the, the growth of crops into areas where particular ones haven't been grown before and the climatic conditions are different or the soil condition or whatever it is. And so you need to modify them in various ways and that's what the plant breeders do. In addition to that, there's a whole business of using hybrid plants where the seeds have to be prepared afresh every year anyway and that has great advantages in yield. So that in itself produces a business of plant breeding. So what is genetic modification then, and how is it different from conventional plant breeding? Well, all changes in plants imply genetic change. When you do something which wasn't there before, when you, when you cross and you confer a property on a plant which wasn't there before, you've done something which we now understand is the movement of a gene from the donor to the recipient, or whatever it happens to be. And this has been done over the, over the millennia probably, no, people guess, up to 10,000 years, something like that. Blindly, people knew that they could do it, but of course they had no idea what it was that they were doing. It's only in the last 100 years or so that people begin to get some sense of what's actually going on, and only in the last 30, 40, 50 years that you could begin to put much detail into it. So it's been going on all the time, what's been, but it's been done blind. And so if you want to move a property from one plant to another because it has some benefit for you, you can't help but move other things along with it in traditional ways. And then you may then have an enormous difficulty sorting out the bit you do want from the bit you don't want. And there are lots and lots of crosses which take a long time. So, that's, so one thing is it that it takes a long time and you can't control it. The other thing is you're very limited to transferring properties only from plants which are related to one another sufficiently closely that they will accept pollen from, a, from a, a donor. What you can do with the next stage, which was actually not genetic engineering in this, in this sense, but was called mutagenesis breeding, which was to bombard plant seeds with x-rays or gamma rays or with chemicals in order to randomly modify the DNA in ways unknown in the hope that you would get something better. And indeed you sometimes do. And that's been in use now for 80 years, 90 years in, in plant breeding, and it's not controlled. There are no safety tests at all, no checks on whether there's the environmental consequences, no regulation other than the standard commercial regulation. And that's a form of genetic engineering that people don't bat an eyelid about. And then, about 30 years ago, people went far enough with their understanding of genetics actually to be able to move a specific gene instead of lots of them and hope for the best, a specific gene from somewhere where you knew it had a certain property to somewhere where you wanted it to have that property. And it requires a skill to do that, and that's what's called genetic modification or transgenesis, transgenesis moving a gene. And that's what it is. 
Well, some people say, <coughs> scientists say that it's the same as biotechnology, um, where organisms like yeast have been adapted and used for modifying um, yeasts and for brewing and, and purposes like that for thousands of years. But isn't that really an oversimplification? Because with genetic manipulation, you are introducing genes from other species, and I think this is where people become uncomfortable. Okay, well, you really asked two questions there. First of all, <clears throat> the use of the word biotechnology. It's, it's actually a word which is now about 100 years old. And the question is, what does it mean? Does it mean something very limited, like moving genes between organisms, or does it mean something broader than that? And I have to say, I take a rather broader view in the sense that a technology, any technology, is the use of understanding and experience in order to produce goods and services, ultimately, if you like, for sale, although say it doesn't have to involve money, it could be a government or a public service, but, but for you, somebody doing something which is useful and building on their understanding and experience to do that. So I think that if you're using biological information to develop a technology, what you develop is biotechnology. And that means then that it's very difficult to draw a boundary between one bit of biotechnology and another. So moving a gene may be a recent development, using a fermenter is clearly much older because people were <coughs> brewing beer and wine and so forth a long time ago. And yet they're both aspects of using biological understanding of one sort or another in order to produce something, goods and services that you want to have. And therefore I, I really reject this idea that biotechnology refers only to moving genes around. I, I would take a much broader view and think that it refers to all commercial, if you like, commercial in the widest sense use. Now the question of species. Interesting question. That. Species in biology is actually an operational definition of organisms which are related but are too far apart to breed together. So it happens at a point in history during the development of a particular strain where there's a divocation div of, of the lines and um, for one reason or another they're no longer to breed. Let me give you a very simple and graphic example. There was a BBC series a couple of years ago about the Congo River. And as the Congo River gets down towards the sea, it gets wider. <coughs> Upriver, where there is still, the river is still narrow enough for them to, commun them to communicate, live a species of monkey or gorilla or something like that. And that species, as they go further down the river, eventually get to the point where they can't cross the river anymore. And from there on down to the sea, they develop into two species <coughs> because they cannot communicate. So there comes a point <coughs> when something happens to one or other of them which in some sense forbids their mating and they become a new species by operational definition. But it's a very small difference. Now how important is that? That's to say is it sort of cataclysmic or is it a minor change in them which nevertheless has that effect? And so I think one has to be very careful about moving things across species. Does it matter that it is a species you're moving across? I think it's all right with small, with small <coughs> variations like that. I think what people are concerned with is putting a gene from, instance, for instance, a jellyfish into a plant. And this, <coughs> this is the sort of thing that has worried people about GM engineering. I, I can imagine it does indeed worry people. And I think it, it, uh, it, it derives from... You perhaps they, they, they don't understand too well what a gene is. A gene is a piece of information and you can move the information from one place to another assuming it will work in the, in the recipient place and produce for you what you want. It's like taking a word out of a book and putting it somewhere else. Uh, if the word means the same thing then you can move it. If, you, if it means something else then you can't. And so when you move a gene there is no... A gene from a fish does not carry a little flag saying I'm a fish. It's a piece of information which in that case happens to come from a fish. But you have to remember that closely related organisms share an enormous number of genes. So we share 98% of our genes with chimpanzees, and I can't remember the numbers, 95 with pigs, 90 with mice, 30% with bananas. Now, I don't feel I look like a banana, and yet I share a considerable number of my genes in principle with bananas. And so how foreign would it therefore be if, for some reason, a banana gene got into me? It might even be one of my own genes. I think you have to be very careful with this species and foreignness argument. Fine. So <coughs> when was GM technology first developed in that case? Well, in what is now called GM technology in the 70s. 
um, people first began to get a clear understanding of what genetic information looked like in the 1950s and it took about 20 years before the, develop, the uh, understanding developed enough so that one could see how they worked and how the information really was coded in some detail and then people um, began to develop ideas and methods for moving them around from a donor to a recipient. So what were they originally looking at in, in, to discover that? I don't remember what they were looking at but one of the clues was that there is an organism called agrobacterium which causes a a, a gall, a, crow, a lump to develop on the, on the stems of plants that it infects and the understanding that the, organ, that the bacterium does it by injecting its DNA into the plant and that bacterial DNA when in the plant then produces this effect. So people <coughs> understood that it was possible to get DNA transfer between species and by that time people could already manipulate bacterial DNA and I think the realisation was that then you could then use this system in order to convey genes of choice into recipients of choice. So why is it now argued that it's essential to safeguard the world's food supplies? Because we've got the t conventional technology, for instance, that used by Norman Borlaug about 50 years ago to produce the dwarfing characteristics in wheat, and this produced a huge increase in crop production. Surely there are other developments in that area which could be just as productive. Well, there may well be, indeed. Um, I think the problem is uh, twofold. One of them is that when you're crossing between related plants, you are limited to what the genes in that particular gene pool may be. And if there is not in that gene pool something that you actually want, then you can't get it. Uh, you can cross to, for, until doomsday, but if it's not there, it won't, it won't appear. And so for some properties, you actually have to go outside that gene pool into wherever it is it, that it exists and find ways of bringing it in. The other thing is that conventional crossing is actually quite slow. You depend on the plant growing and so it takes seasons in order to do this. Whereas with, with um, doing it by the strand genesis, by genetic modification, you can do a lot of it in the lab very quickly because you're working with only single cells or parts of a plant which you grow in small dishes so you don't have to wait the whole growing season. It's only later on when you test the, <coughs> excuse me, test the resulting plants that you actually need to grow them up full and see whether what you've done is what you think it's going to be. Um, so it, it cuts time a lot and therefore in that sense saves money and saves time. So you can do things which are beyond your capacity using conventional technology. And then it comes a matter of opinion as to what you need to do. You're right. Bor what Borlaug did was extremely important, but there are other things which need to be done. For example, if climate change is as serious as many people think, then there are going to have to be considerable modifications of agricultural practice to deal with it. Plants that we have now, which will not grow under certain conditions, are going to somehow to have to be persuaded to grow under new conditions, and that may not be easy. Why has the development of plant transgenics been mainly carried out by large-scale private companies and not government organisations? Because oh. they must see the, see the uh, huge value of it in, well, in government. Yes, I think you need to go back into history in that. And the, uh, uh, again, back to the 1970s when this technology was... Well, with this technique, it, it wasn't that, not then a technology, it was only a, a technique. A technology is doing something, you remember. A technique is simply an, an ability to do something. Um, the technique was invented in the 1970s. If you cast your mind back to the 1970s, it was the time of the oil crises. You remember the <coughs> Israeli-Egyptian war, the oil price doubled, then it doubled again, then there was a revolution in Iran and so forth, and, and the oil price went through the roof. It was a time of rapid inflation and governments cut back. Now, you know what happens when government cut back. They cut back on fundamental research as being one of the first and softest targets. So at this most exciting time in biology, since Darwin, governments were cutting back and the private sector realised the potential benefits. So the, um, the medical aspects were picked up by the <coughs> pharmaceutical companies or perhaps even more so by the startups, the small biotech startups. And the agricultural aspects were picked up by the, by the seed breeders and by who, who also, some of whom also chemical companies. Now one of the things that influenced them was Rachel Carlson and Silent Spring, which had developed an, uh, an atmosphere of being anti-chemical. I mean, it's 
I'm putting it very generally. People were looking for ways in which they could reduce the amount of chemicals which were sprayed around one way or another. People were looking for biological solutions to these ongoing problems of controlling weeds and controlling pests. And the ideas then arose that you might be able to do it usefully in this sort of way. And so some companies, one in particular, was very keen to move from being a chemical company to being a biological company, and they were really the pioneers in, in starting this. And they were Monsanto. Monsanto. Yeah. So Monsanto, I think, now is, is uh, quite in the, to quite a small degree, I don't have the number, 10 or 20% only a chemical company, whereas before this it was 100% a chemical company. And they made the conscious decision that it was that they ought to do it, go in this direction, and that's what they did. But it wasn't this because they also had a, a chemical which was, would work very well. Oh, yes, with, I mean, fit. I mean, the glyphosate was, was a chemical which would have, which worked very well with, with um, yes. monoculture. Yes, indeed, yeah, they, they yeah. saw it, it was part of their business strategy and their business interest to do it, sure. And so it's only a, a very small number of, of multinationals who can really afford Well, you see, in the investment. The, well, indeed, in the beginning, of course, nobody, first of all, nobody knew whether it would work, and secondly, nobody knew whether it would be acceptable, and nobody knew how much it was going to cost, and it could cost a lot. I mean, they just weren't in a position to decide. So it was really only people with deep pockets who had a hope of getting anywhere with this. So it required big companies. <clears throat> and as soon as the opposition began to develop, then any thoughts that small companies may have had to get into the game were really completely squashed because the cost of going forward in terms of paying for the development costs and getting through the regulatory procedures was so high that small companies couldn't cope with it. So it was very different from the medical field where a small company gets an idea, develops it for, develops it for a bit and then is bought out or merges with or whatever with a larger company that has the resources to go through the development and the marketing. So it's the, the um, agricultural use of GM has remained stuck, largely, not entirely, in the Western world, in, in the hands of a relatively small number of private companies, a situation which is exacerbated by the opposition. The more opposition there is, the more this happens. And those people who complain about it being concentrated in the hands of large companies have got largely themselves to blame for it. And that's also because in Western countries, governments do not develop products for sale. Governments sponsor research, and in fact, our and other Western governments do exactly that. And so, UK and other Europeans work on these topics in the lab, but they're not really allowed or encouraged to work on them in the field or towards the market. But when you get to other countries, that's not the case. In China, for example, or in India, or in Mexico, or the Philippines, or other places, government agencies become involved and they are therefore not dependent on Western companies, they do it themselves. But they don't have the same legislative problems? They, uh, well, they may or they may not. It depends on the companies and uh, other countries. And in some cases, because the Western companies who are usually, or at least who were for a long time, leaders in the field, did not see much business opportunity for their own products in the poorer countries, and they were willing to give their technology away for use in those countries. But presumably that also meant they could sell their chemicals? In, in... Well, maybe they weren't all chemically based. Some of them were insect resistance which were not chemically based and therefore they didn't gain from that at all. Um, and the main chemical for this is now off patent anyway, so that advantage has disappeared for them. And smaller seed companies were mainly bought up by the by the large chemical companies Somewhere. because they had the they had the, tech, the basic technology and because they didn't have resources to take these things to completion that was a critical factor I think whereas they had been very successful with conventional plant feeding smaller private companies some of them had yes um, but the, the promise of this new technology was just so great that everybody who could wanted to be in it because they could see the opportunity for doing things which were really beyond their capacity at an early stage.